Alright, this is the second um, video recording of um, chapter 9. We've just spent a little time here talking about um, the definition of allocation and how starch and sucrose compete for that allocation. Um, it's depending on where the plant needs to partition those assimilates, um, which means the distribution of the photo assimilates to different plant organs. Um, and then also, or for different purposes, and then also translocation to move those photoassimilates photo assimilates now around. Um, photoassimilates are moved by um, through the phloem, and we talked about how aphids kind of helped reveal some of the functions associated with phloem. That phloem sap is under positive pressure, and that the phloem sap includes a large quantity or in h uh, high concentrations of sucrose which are the products of photosynthesis that are transportable around the plant, plus other organic compounds. And chapter 9 actually goes into quite a bit of detail about some of the other components of phloem sap, but we're just concentrating on the um, photoassimilates, the sucrose there. Um, and then we move into how phloem sap moves through the phloem by um, an explanation called the, flow, the pressure flow hypothesis. And the driver is a hydrostatic pressure gradient. So uh, phloem sap moves from what we call a source to a sink um, in the plant. The source end of phloem is nearby uh, some kind of um, place where sucrose is accumulating, like just after photosynthesis, sucrose accumulates in the mesophyll cell. Um, or perhaps if it was um, f stored for over a period of time in the root, and then that those um, as starch and then starch is going to break down into glucose or sucrose and be mobilized to other parts of the plant towards a sink um, such as towards growing leaf buds, fruits, flowers um, or a sink can be you know uh, for storage basically after uh, sucrose is synthesized it can be stored as uh, starch or it can actually be stored in vacuoles as sucrose in for example sugar cane or sugar beets all right, uh, and those are sucrose. That's when sucrose is stored in like a vacuole. All right, so um, we're going to continue with what this diagram is showing us as far as um, the establishment of that hydrostatic pressure gradient in phloem, as well as the establishment of a water potential gradient in, in the nearby xylem. So we talked about how sucrose following uh, photosynthesis is transported uh, either by diffusion or active transport into a sieve element. Um, and so you can see the osmotic potential is negative 1.7, which is a, a low osmotic potential, suggesting it has a high concentration of solutes. Um, the nearby xylem here has a solute potential or osmotic potential of negative 0.1, suggesting there's a very low concentration of solutes in the, in the, the vessel element here. Um, xylem being uh, non-living is always under negative pressure and so it has a negative pretensional potential whereas the phloem um, sieve element has a positive pressure so living cells with a plasma membrane have a positive pressure and so then we see the resulting water potential um, is negative 1.1 in this um, sieve element compared to the nearby xylem which is negative 0.8 so remember that water flows down a water potential gradient and that's what's going to drive water entering the sieve element and that's going to drive up the pressure inside this sieve element. Um, so high concentration of, of sucrose pulls in water, essentially increases the pressure inside the cell. And then if we compare that what's happening in the sink and here of phloem, we have a sink cell shown here. Perhaps this is a root cell um, taking up sucrose to then store it. So we, have, we see the sucrose is moving out of the sink end of phloem and across the companion cell into the sink cell. And so the sucrose concentration is dec declining in this um, sink end of the phloem. And as sucrose concentration goes down, then the osmotic potential is going to increase compared to up here at the source end. So we, go, we see a negative 1.7 uh, osmotic potential in the source end of phloem, and now a resulting um, negative 0.7 uh, megapascals 
for the osmotic potential at, at the sink end of flow. This does say 0 0.7 as in a positive number, which is, has to be a typo, so make sure you correct that as negative 0.7 because osmotic potential is always negative. The highest number osmotic potential can be, remember, is 0, um, which is the osmotic potential of pure water, so this has to be a negative number. Um, and that makes our addition correct here for our water potential. Okay, so as the um, sucrose is pulled out or either diffusing or actively transported out of the sink end, um, then the osmotic potential increases. That's going to increase this water potential. And if we look at the osmotic, the water potential of the nearby xylem vessel element here, we can see that the water potential in phloem is higher than the water potential in xylem. And that's going to drive water out of phloem into xylem. So remember, the, it's um, the sucrose leaving leaves a higher osmotic potential, which drives up the water potential, allowing water to move into the nearby xylem. Then, um, so so that's what drives phloem sap through phloem, um, mainly driven by this pressure gradient. Because remember. Um, flow and sap moves down a hydrostatic pressure gradient. So we have to pay attention to the pressure potential uh, in this um, series. So going from positive 0.6 down to ne uh, positive 0.3. But that's, um, that hydrostatic pressure gradient is basically driven by the movement of water from the xylem into phloem and from the phloem back into xylem. So those, it's interesting how the two uh, interact to help facilitate flow and sap transport or um, translocation. All right. All right. There are a couple of mechanisms on um, how flow it how sucrose is loaded into flow and how it's unloaded. So sucrose is loaded into flow from the source end and uh, or into the source end of flow and sucrose is unloaded uh, at the sink end of flow and those can be active or passive processes. Um, so this slide here just reminds us um, the anatomy of phloem. Make sure that you take a look at the uh, sieve elements. Uh, again, this is ba basically based on um, lecture material from the you know first couple of lectures of the course. Um, basically, a sieve tube element they, um, is the individual cell here. It is a living cell but it uh, mainly just contains cytoplasm um, and primary thickened well, primary cell walls that are thickened that's what makes uh, helps make vascular tissue sort of a supporting material as well um, and then very few Organelles. It looks like it has some smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's shown here, a couple of plasmids. But there's no nucleus. There's no um, mitochondria for the most part. Um, and so that leaves a lot of volume here for, for flow and sap to flow through without the hindrance of, of all various um, organelles kind of, you know, obstructing the, that pathway. Flow and sap moves through these little openings in here called the sieve plate. Uh, and so you can see those in the end walls here. And because sieve elements, sieve tube elements, have very few organelles, they have a companion cell um, that's adjacent to them that sort of takes care of the needs of the sieve tube element. So the companion cell is where we find um, the nucleus, the mitochondria, uh, and other organelles that help support the functioning of the sieve tube element. Because remember, the sieve tube element is living. It does have also a plasma membrane within the inside of the the cell wall um, which remembers why we said it always has positive pressure so make sure you review the anatomy of phloem and can compare it to the anatomy of xylem so we started to talk about uh, how phloem loading and unloading occurs and these diagrams may basically show phloem loading mechanisms and so we start with symplastic loading which means that, as you see in this diagram and over here in this figure, that if this is the mesophyll cell, let's see, do we have these labels? Yeah, M for mesophyll cell. Um, that's where the sucrose is uh, accumulating from photosynthesis. They can pass through plasma desmata. So this is the symplastic loading is where sucrose passes through plasma desmata. 
Lopez Hanada. This is supposed to be an O right there. Um, just sim by simple diffusion into the companion cell, which then takes it into um, the sieve element. Um, and so that's one method of phloem loading. Um, another method of phloem loading is shown down here below or in this uh, diagram here, where once sucrose diffuses into the um, companion cell, it can form sort of this large polymer. St um, there are different polymers that form, such as sucrose, uh, or rather raffinose or stachyose. These are longer um, molecules that, that just simply don't fit through the plasma desmata um, or, uh, once they're in the sieve tube element. It, it basically prevents them from they can fit through to go into the sieve element, but they can't um, easily pass back into the um, mesophyll cell. So it prevents, it's called polymer trapping, it prevents these um, sucrose molecules from diffusing back out. And so those are two forms of symplastic loading. And apoplastic loading is simply where the sucrose gets into the, diffuses into the apoplast, and then it has to pass actively um, we see here active transport actively through a hydrogen ion sucrose symporter and that um, uses uh, a membrane potential energy from the membrane potential um, that is um, created by a hydrogen ion pump. So this is a little review of the kind of active transport that we talked about earlier in the semester with regard to how nutrients are taken up. Um, and so we see a little more detail about um, apoplastic loading um, in terms of this active transport here. Just a review of, of material we've already talked about. So here's the hydrogen ion pump it actively pumps um, hydrogen ions out of the cell and then together is taken back up through a, a co-transporter here. This is a symporter because it brings hydrogen ions and sucrose um, up, uh, but takes it up in the same direction into the cell rather than in opposite directions. All right, so um, that's one way, that's basically one of these methods of phloem loading. Phloem unloading can also um, require uh, energy um, from ATP through this hydrogen ion pump. Um, whoops, here we go. Uh, as well as by diffusion uh, and a couple of other different methods that we won't um, go into such detail about. But so, but the but the general idea is if we go back up to here to look at our phloem uh, sap movement through the phloem, we can generally say that this movement of phloem sap is a uh, passive process. It doesn't require energy, but in some cases there is energy that's required to load that sucrose initially in the source cell or to unload the sucrose from the, um, the sink end of phloem into the sink cell. But, but overall we would say that phloem transport otherwise um, is by pressure flow, which does not require um, ATP or active transport. All right, so that pretty much sums up what we need to discuss with chapter 9 for this next exam.